he is never stopped innovating. Like the minute you 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 settle, or become complacent, you think you've finished the product. A product is never finished, ever finished. And those that that um, um, and I know some people that that would have you know may have worked with me in the past. Um, they 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 may have a differing uh, opinion, but. You've got to continue the evolution. You should have a full roadmap. You should have ideas. The day that you stop having ideas is the day you may as well step off the bus. Kia ora, welcome everyone. Today we are having a live uh, conversation with Luke Irving, CEO and founder at Fingermark. Luke, uh, we're going to have a bit of a chat about your career journey leading up into tech, but before we kick things off, perhaps a quick introduction for those that aren't acquainted as to who you are and what is Fingertech? Uh, Fingermark, sorry. <laughs> Fingermark, that's all right, mate. I, um, uh, yeah, so my name's Luke Irving. I'm um, founder and CEO of Fingermark. We're a 16-year-old technology company based out of Hawke's Bay uh, in, in New Zealand. Uh we predominantly work in the QSR um, space, the quick service restaurant, so fast food, uh, McDonald's, uh, KFC, um, and and many others. Um, our, you know, the, the technology we provide is is focused around opt- optimization, uh, optimization efficiency, focused around speed, really, just trying to help these restaurants go faster through um, hardware and software, AI, um, from kiosks right through to machine vision applications. So we sort of play right across the whole spectrum of the restaurant. Um, and uh, so, we, yeah, we play from a consumer side and we play from a staffing and, and um, staffing side as well. Outstanding. Now, it's a pretty incredible um, success story and one that's continuing to grow really fast. So we'll kick into that part in the sort of second half of this conversation. But before we get there, Luke, we'd love to rewind the tape a little bit and sort of hear more about your journey. So can you remember uh, when you were a, a younger fella what you were thinking about doing, um, sort of what we were, you were aspiring to do when you grew up? Um, I, I think I always wanted to be a, a, a sort of a lead singer of a rock and roll band, to be honest. And, and I, I have to admit, I, I probably still do um, if, if my, my family and friends were, were, were to, be, to be asked. Um, but yeah, I think I wanted to be a, an airline pilot for for quite a while. I, I was just um, fascinated with planes. I still am, and, and funnily enough, ended up living on them for for, for many years um, pre-COVID. Um, but uh, got shot down through um, uh, dicky eyesight and sort of moved on to other things. But uh, through school, I wasn't really a, a high achiever. I, I'd sort of learned in different ways, and back then the curriculum didn't really. Um, it didn't really cater for, for people that kind of had a bit more of a creative mind, I suppose. Um, played a lot of sport, um, excelled in sport um, with cricket and hockey, and um, that kind of kept me progressing through the, the years of school, uh, but certainly wasn't um, – the, the, there was a bit of a bloodbath in terms of my uh, my my exams and, and uh, exam marks. So, you know, I'd, it was it was an interesting time. Um, after I sort of failed my seventh form, after failing sixth form, after almost failing fifth form, I uh, decided that education um, was was not my uh, direction and decided to take up a, a sporting contract in, in England. So went over there and and really just, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say to anyone that doesn't, you know, leaving school that, that hasn't really got a direction is to get on a plane and go and see the world. It's it's the most amazing uh, inspiring thing I, I, I did and completely opened opened me up to the possibilities of, of what, what you can do um, if you really just be brave enough to, to step out of your comfort zone. So so ended up over there and then kind of after a couple of years of following around, I think the, uh, the parents um, saw that I was, I was probably um, going down roads I shouldn't, so um, quickly got me back home. And, and then from there it was... Um, it was there. Just I, I knew I didn't really want to go to university. Uh, didn't didn't want to study. It wasn't me. I, I had all these ideas, and I, I don't know how they came about. Um, even back in school, I had ideas that were playing it out, and, and but really, it came down to um, I think I, I it was a, it was a chance meeting with one of my my first employers out of when I got back, and he 
owned a, um, one of the first email wine companies. Uh, and just the way he went about, he was young in business, taking risks, you know, you're running down at 4.30 on a Friday to, to bank all the checks so he could buy stock the next, well, it was just exciting, exhilarating. So I kind of knew that I wanted to, to be in business, but it's, it was just really trying to find the, the opportunity to get in. And uh, a friend approached me around, we're kind of doing a wine broking thing. And I was 20 at the time. And then from there, I got an opportunity to buy into a liquor delivery business, which was in Dunedin called Thirsty Boys. Um, and, and then from there, that was the start of my kind of my, my business journey. Um, yeah. That failed very quickly. Um, burning, <laughs> burned, f- felt the, the 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 early stages of a of a of a fast burn, uh, monthly burn on on uh, on revenue, and um, and then bounced around about three or four different ideas from starting the you know the New Zealand's first student magazine, Lucid, right through to um, opening a bar to you know setting up a, a clothing label to to eventually ended up in setting up finger mark so it was a bit of a bit of a wild ride yeah yeah so just rewinding back there a little bit so the aspirations of being a singer in a rock band was that you know um something that you're actually doing were you a singer at high school or was that more just uh <laughs> no. someone that was piping no. up at, at parties and in the shower no it was, it was more shower singing mate yeah <laughs> if i was if i was brutally honest and um but uh, I, I do like to get up get up there and karaoke at any oppo- opportune time but i'm not particularly good um and uh, i don't pretend to be either i just like having a crack and but i, I do love those i do love a good front man that's for sure um <laughs> in, a, in a rock band I, I admire them as as great great entertainers and performers so a lot of guts to get up there and do what they do yeah, outstanding. I um, had a conversation with Surian Taylor recently who sort of talked about um, his early years at university in a touring rock and roll band as well. So it sounded like quite a fun time. Um, so yeah. when you went overseas from high school, was that to London? And, um, you know, can you talk about the sporting contract as well? Was that playing cricket or what were you doing? Yeah, so that was playing cricket um, and then went up and it was kind of like a quasi gap year um, and ended up over... Uh, up in the Midlands and um, and played uh, sort of minor counties, Shropshire, and, and that was good fun. Like it was just a completely different world. Um, you know, I'd never really travelled further than Australia. So as a as an 18-year-old, you, you're just like, wow, um, you know, going down to London, you're on the tube, you know, all of these things that are just, well, you know, you know, that's kind of the, the rite of passage. And over there with quite a few other Kiwis that were doing their gap year as well. So heaps of... Uh, Heaps of fun. Um, and then when that finished, um, I ended up jumping on a plane to Dublin and lived in Dublin for, for over a year. And that was wild, man. That was so much fun. Um, and, and uh, yeah, and I, I ended up studying as a chef. So you got into, into the food gig then. And, um, uh, and just, yeah, I, that was more just to fund my, my uh, heathenistic lifestyle on the weekends. <laughs> And is it the uh, the time in London that the parents started to get a bit concerned as to some of these roads that you were getting? No, that was that, that, that was Dublin, um, yeah, Dublin, I think. So they um, they would they they came over. I remember that they flew over, and um, I hadn't seen them in almost two years. And they my my dad just didn't recognise me at the airport when I went sort of went up to give him a hug. I'd sort of peroxide blonde hair and beads, and oh, mate, I was. I was completely different from the boy leaving Palmerston North in an air tex and a pair of moleskins to, to that. Um, it was a bit of a bit of a shock for the olds. Um, yeah. So anyway, they got me back home safe and sound. Yeah, and not a hell of a lot of cricket going on in in Ireland. Uh, I don't imagine. So you're mainly just concentrating. Played, on a, the... few, played a few games actually. Funnily enough, I played for um, Bulls Bridge, which. Uh, uh, Van Morrison has has a lot to do with, so you got to see him sort of floating around the the traps. Um, so no, it was it was yeah, not much cricket, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. And then so you came back and started to get involved in business. You mentioned the uh, email wine or subscription business, and then moving to Dunedin yeah. to sort of try a few things. Um, yeah. What were some of the sort of lessons that you learnt uh, in that early stage, apart from figuring out that that was something that you were really keenly interested in being involved in? 
Well, yeah, some of the early lessons, I, I think um, I knew nothing. Like I knew nothing about business and starting business and running, you know, filing tax returns and hiring people. It was, and I, I'll be brutally honest, for the first you know, I probably wasn't until I was 30 and five, five years into to Fingermark that I actually started to realise the importance of a lot of this stuff. Um, and it was loose. It was real a real wild ride of, of um, I, the, the, the thing that I could do was sell. And and I can. I can sell anything. Trying to produce something and then sell it is, is one of the most satisfying things you can do. Um, and it's it's the thrill of, of, of owning a business. Um and I would I would say to anyone that if you you know even if you're not a salesman, learn to sell your product. Be passionate. You know, no one sells it better than the one that's created it. Um, but I, I suppose the lessons I, I learned there was was always I think you need really good people around you, um, and and put a you know the, the ones that complement you know complement your skill set. I was hopeless with accounts and dyslexic to a point with with uh, reading numbers and and. Uh, but I was doing a lot of that. So it was certainly understanding cash flow forecast, all of these things that, you know, everyone was telling me to do. I was just wasn't interested and and didn't have anyone doing it. So I was running um, pretty much blind to how the business was going. As long as I was doing the next deal, um, then I, it would kind of keep things moving. And in the early stages of the finger mark, um, you know, you look at it now, it's a global technology business. The first five years, man, were, were like that. It was loose. Yeah, Wild West. Interesting. So the, the early stages of Fingermark, if we can kind of go back to that. So you'd moved from Dunedin, presumably um, up north at that stage. And how, how did the idea come together? So what was that sort of ideation phase for Fingermark? So I'd, I was um, I had a bar. I was in Wellington at the, at the time. And um, we, we employed a touchscreen, put a touchscreen till in one of the old uh, Casio things. And back then, like this is 2001, you know, these um, no, people weren't thinking about touchscreens in this way. Like it was a functional device for, you know, predominantly point of sale terminals. Uh, there was no iPhones, there was no tablets, nothing, none of that. So, what I saw there is an opportunity to be able to use this for for, for more purpose. So I love the self service channel. Like we had a bar which was really busy for um, kind of. For, we made about seventy percent of our money across about three or four hours of the week two hours on a Friday, two hours on a Saturday. I was like, how can we pump more money through the till and, you know, have people producing drinks and try table service, all of these things. So what I realized is that if you could alleviate bottlenecks through your, your most profitable times of your business, how do you, you know, what, what, do you, what technology can help you do that? So I was looking at these touchscreen tills and saying, could I flip them around and have a few of these scattered around the, the bar? Um, so that was the early stage of how I was starting to think about the technology. <clears throat> um, and it wasn't until probably uh, a year or two later, I was working for a company which we started rolling out touchscreen terminals around the country. I was getting, um, by doing that, it was exposing me to a lot of businesses which were thinking about it as well. Um, uh, the, the, the issue I had was I was trying to convince the company I was working for that this was a really, this is a good opportunity. Like I see this, this is happening more and more. If we could custom build or provide a, a business that supports any type of application on touchscreens. And then that's kind of how I started to think. Um, they weren't interested. They owed me a lot of money. I was like running broke um, and had literally no money. And I remember my sister, I was coming back from London. I had to drive out to pick, to pick her up. And I remember um, the, the the email that I sent her. I said, look, you're going to have to pay me some money to put some petrol in the car just to get us back into town from Auckland. Like that's how that's how broke I was. But it, while I was out there waiting for her, uh, flight had been delayed. The American Express uh, terminal was, you know, those those back then it was it will be touchscreen now. Funny enough, but it's back then it was just a person standing there trying to sign people up to American Express. So I had nothing else to do. The flight was delayed, so I so I basically um, signed myself up for American Express, um, and then, you know. Seven days later, in the mail, they they basically said, "Oh, you qualified for um, you know twelve thousand dollar gold card," and I was like, "Shit!" But you got to prove your your um your your uh, your salary. So um, anyway, uh, might have done a few uh, dodgy things there. But anyway, the the the, the long and the short of it was they sent me a, a credit card um, in the mail seven days later, and 
that was the twelve thousand dollars that helped me set up Fingermark. Wow! Oh, so, so, so you had had the idea from seeing that there was a um, technology that was starting to bubble up in different industries, but you couldn't yeah. find something that existed, or were you had you lined something up? Couldn't that you find saw? anything. Couldn't find anything that existed. No one was doing it. It was it was a bit of a um, anyone that was bringing in kiosks or the early stage were, were basically bringing them from China. Australia had a few companies that were starting to go well. Um, and yeah, so I just, I, I managed to team up with Next Window, which was a very successful New Zealand tech company. Um, and they were building, basically turning big LCDs into, into touchscreens or that they, they, they developed the camera technology to do it, but they didn't have anyone that would, could um, I sort of productize it into something and then go and sell it. So I became that. So as Fingermark set up, we, we spun up, launched the company, and then Rebel Sports came along. Um, so I just basically cobbled together a whole lot of technology, um, outsourced to a, to a development house that developed the application, which was a shoe selector. Basically, um, uh, they had a huge bottleneck on, on advice in, in the store when it was busy. Um, they'd have one shoe specialist, um, but they needed two or three. Um, once again, it's through those really um, profitable times bottlenecks so technology can so basically I developed this application that sat on the wall 32 inch touchscreen and they um, Rebel Sports loved it and rolled it out so I factored it I got my first invoice factored that and then basically cash started rolling in and we started building the company Outstanding. Um, so simple. you so you were just out there selling uh, essentially on behalf of the company that was creating the technology or were you um, sort of customizing it based on the, the product we, we would take we would take the raw materials and then I basically took the raw materials and then just put put it all together into a solution so that's kind of how we started um, and then once I saw that I started going off in all these crazy tangents around I brought in a, a an artist to actually design um, we've still got them in our foyer um, these fiberglass kiosks which were just sexy things you know um, one was called Sophia Laron. Uh, the other one was called Fat Boy because it was huge and it needed to go on a diet because it was it, it came out of the plug too big. But anyway, they, these were literally legit kiosks that were scattered around different businesses around Auckland. It was hilarious. Um, and they were just coming out of my ideas that um, came out of my mind. And that sort of filtered through. And then you start meeting design engineers and, you, you know, specialists that can help add, add value to your business. And then you you kind of build this this network of people around you that can handle more important deals as they come in. Yeah, interesting. And then from a sales standpoint, were you focusing on any specific industry or was it quite uh, broad in terms of where you were looking for the, the potential solution? Anyone, <laughs> anyone. So li literally like I was just, I was, um, it was just, you know, I, I could, I could sell it really, you know, I could sell the dream. So I was, I was just I'd sniff out anything, got involved in the industry any any uh, word that I had on the street that that someone was looking for something similar, I'd be on the phone and in there, you know, absolutely. And and you just got really good at it. You got to flow on, and and so, but it, it sort of, it, you know, after the GFC sort of had rolled past, it was about you know 2009. I realised that we 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 just had to um, we had to focus on specific areas. So we couldn't just be something to everyone because we weren't scalable. So we were just you know, we just ended up being a signage shop basically, and that's not where I really wanted it. But at this stage, I was starting to grow up. I was sort of late twenties, um, starting to take take myself a bit more seriously, um, and and then we realised that we just had to focus on a couple of markets. So I had to literally turn off all of these clients' revenue and stuff in industries which we weren't weren't um, uh, didn't feel we had global scale opportunities with. So we stuck with healthcare. Um, healthcare we spun out, in, which is my another company of ours, Florence. Um, and, um, and then we stuck with, with fast food. And at that stage, we developed a, a, a world first subway payment kiosk. And then we'd, um, and then by, from developing that, Restaurant Brands New Zealand found us and said, like, come into our, we need your skills to be able to start digitizing and going through digital transformation. And at that time, you know, that's 12 years ago um, that, you know, that's when the whole QSR fast food digital transformation started. So yeah. we were right on the cusp of that. And then we basically just went deep on that industry.
And the best thing we could have done, like, you know, I, I was pretty skeptical at the time. Uh, it took me a few years to turn off the, the noise and stop focusing on anything else. But once we did, we, it was true. Like you just really, you, you, you become a specialist in your field and, and you, you see the opportunities and you can fix them faster. Interesting. And then so with the $12,000 American Express credit card and then some sales, was this just all self-funded or at any point there did you yeah. take on some external funding? Yeah, we've, t- we've, we've, we've been a bit different. Um, we, we really haven't, um, we're not a, a classic tech business where I'm, I'm a bit more old school, I'll always say it. Like we've, we've developed, like I was kind of a sole director for many of my years. Um, we're a f- family and friends funded business. Um, from that 12,000, my uncle um, bought in about uh, 15 to 20% to fund the subway development. Um, and then we didn't take any capital in the business for another 13 years. So only started just before COVID, we took on our first capital in the business. Um, so we grew through cash flow, through um, leveraging our relationships with our clients, um, through understanding how to work with the banks. And we're very, very fortunate to have a couple of really good bank relationships and um, and a really good relationship with um, with Grant Thornton and Andrew Harris there, who's who basically taught us the ways of, you know, rearranging the way you, you present your figures. It's not, it's not presenting them, um, uh, you know, fraudulently. It's actually just showing them the growth stage and exactly allowing them to see how your business is going to grow, which pillars of revenue, where's your profitability, and then forecast it out into a forecasted P&L. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I was going to the bank and saying, well, this is my deal here and here. And they're going, well, we can't fund you on that because you've got no – You've, you've got intangible assets. You've got nothing to, you've got no house. You know, it's just you and you, um, it's just you. Um, so it's changing the way that they looked at it and banks were starting to, to leverage um, businesses in different ways to, to, to find um, value and, and assets to leverage against. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of how we, how we rolled and we really pushed the banks to, to, to work with us and we we delivered. Like we, we've, all the forecasts that we put by the COVID year, we hit, um, and it wasn't, and it's been sustainable growth. That, um, but, but it's it's been the right growth because I think if we tried to go any faster, the market wouldn't have kept up with us. Like I, I just, I think you got to know your market well enough to know um, how fast you want to push it. Otherwise, you bring on all these people for the steep growth, and yet the growth isn't real. It's not there. So. I take a different approach and I've seen a lot of businesses fall over by um, taking on a huge amount of capital um, and the market's just not ready. So you've got to be, you got to have a, a, it's like a sixth sense around that. Good business people will have that. Interesting. So that sort of organic growth story and coming out of the, uh, what you described as the wild, wild west phase of the business till today, what is the current state of the business in terms of headcount and the markets that you're operating in and, Give us a quick snapshot of how things look at the moment. So we've got we're we're, we're just um, shy on a hundred FTEs uh, around five. Uh, we've got uh, offices in Dubai, um, US, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, um, and we'll be looking into Canada um, pretty soon. So our North American um, uh, push is 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 pretty real. Um, we've got a team of 40 uh, coming up 50 down in um, uh, down in Havelock North, uh, it's old Silicon Village, um, <laughs> and we uh, and then we've got a couple of we've set it we're setting up an Auckland uh, Auckland office as well, potentially a Wellington office too. We've just um, uh, bought a company down down in Wellington, so we're we're, we're kind of on this. Um, it's a really cool, interesting growth phase that we're in. It is once again controlled, but. You know, our hiring policy, we loved bringing in people from overseas, you know, into especially developers. We had a great connection with Brazil. We've got a, a team of developers up there. Um, but we, we found that sourcing talent from overseas, you bring them in, they, they, they love the, the Hawke's Bay. So it was easier to move them there. Um, and, you know, obviously with COVID, the borders shut, we've had to change our strategy. But, um, but we've actually brought on a, a couple of recent hires, which are, are really keen to move to Hawke's Bay, which is, which is great. So, um, but, uh, so th- we work with um, 
we work with, you know, we've got a big market in Australia. We're, we're probably the market leader in Australia in terms of our technology. Um, we're moving into computer vision. So um, more around that sort of vision intelligence systems. Um, so we've been working on that for five years and we've, we've sort of really cracked the code of building a really um, agile platform to solve different problems in different industries. Through COVID, we, we took some of the technology we developed for the drive through um, in, in say fast foods, which we were timing cars, tracking um, speed of service and giving that data in real time back to the, to the operators. And we realized that there was some other opportunities out there more around health and safety around some of the stuff that we're doing. So we took it into the mining industry of all places and we've just gone absolutely berserk. So that business will be set up as a separate company, kind of a cat and a dog. Um, but another really successful um, business, New Zealand business, that's that's going places over there. So um, d- just it's just a fascinating industry. Um, and I think the, the cool thing with us is we've we've come from a really consumer facing technology and, and kiosk and interactive. So bringing that across and blending it with a whole massive data capture system um, to visualize that data is is kind of where our unique spotters so what we can do with that how can we leverage data in real time and and send messages at the right to the right people at the right time and and it's suggestive suggestive selling suggestive prompting around better operations hey do this now um, or buy this now that's kind of what we're trying to trying to go for um, it's it's challenging really challenging work um, you know, visual intelligence is, is hard. It's, it's uh, you know, getting that, that data set clean so you're actually getting accurate data is, is the key. Once you've got accurate data, you get trust in that data, so you get engagement and engagement from the people you're trying to influence. So that's kind of where we're at um, as a company. Um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Like we're, you know, we're pushing pretty hard. We've just landed um, four of the top six QSRs in in the US um, in terms of pilots um, and different stages of pilots and rollouts. Um, so that's pretty exciting. We've got our, yeah, the, the team is just really gearing up for, for big scale next year. Yep. Exciting. And then in terms of the how the business actually operates in terms of the um, Silicon Village versus the um, sort of hubs that you have in the locations that you mentioned, are they sort of just sales hubs and all of the technology is created and implemented out of the Hawke's Bay or how does it work? Yeah, a bit of, bit of both. Um, we, we've taken on a, a distributed team approach, so remote first. So um, that, that, that's our approach and our strategy for the next couple of years. We, we've kind of had that. We, we've got a, a development team in Brazil, so we've got a really close relationship with, uh, with those guys over there. And they're fantastic, like awesome people to work with. Um, and then obviously down here as well. Um, but we've got our head of product and head of engineering are up in Auckland. So we kind of, we work in a, it's a distributed model. So, you know, we, we're interested in, in really uh, um, quality people which are interested in what we're doing, can add value to what we're doing, but you don't necessarily have to be in the, in the hubs of where we are. The US is predominantly a, a sales and, and operations hub, but that'll grow into being a technology hub as well, I'd imagine, as, as it grows. And then also I read that you moved the business uh, to the Hawke's Bay a few years ago now. What was the driving force behind uh, leaving Auckland and down to the Hawke's Bay? And what's been the experience of um, setting up shop down in the Bay? Yeah, it's it was an interesting one. So... I don't know. I just, I, I just, I just hit a wall with Auckland. Um, you know, I'm from Palmerston North. Emma was from Omaru, so we're kind of in that sort of provincial yokel um, sort of uh, you know, mode of life. Anyway, we sort of know what it was like, and um, you know, kids biking around and stuff. And I think we 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 had Edie, so she was young. Uh, Ted was on the way, um, and we kind of just looked at it. So I just was going nowhere with with Auckland and you know the leadership and and we would get and when you're really trying to focus on an industry which is technically you know 90 percent 95 percent overseas you were getting a lot of distraction from industry saying hey we've got this project like your Auckland transports your councils relationships you've had and it was just noisy um and I, I also found it really hard to think um so what I what I did is just 
we started looking, I said, DMs, we're, we're, we're out of here. So we, we, we looked at different places. She was keen to go to Queenstown. I was keen to sort of stay in North Island, but closer to Auckland, thinking that the business would move down a couple of years later, maybe two or three years later, but we would commute. Um, and then, so we ended up settling on Hawke's Bay and we fit the house that we bought a house here and we just like loved it. And that sort of solidified we were going. And then the, um, I ended up sort of flying my whole team down and their partners just to say, Hey, this is where we're moving to. Um, just, you know, just as a more of a gift really for their hard work. Anyway, two weeks later, uh, and it was a perfect Hawke's Bay weekend. Um, <laughs> and two weeks later, they, I get bailed up by the whole team got sat down and they said, listen, we, um, unfortunately, uh, we've got some, got some good and bad news for you. And I was like, oh shit, they're all going to walk. This is not good. Um, and they said, well, we, um, we're all coming down with you. We've all decided we're coming. And I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) really? And I said, yep. So there was only one that didn't, didn't come down out of a team of, I think we had 12 to 13, and then we had some that stayed up there, but yeah, 13 came down eventually over, over six months. That's so I had to not that. only move myself down, and, but I had to move about 10, 12 families down as well, which was really cool. Um, so a bit sooner than we thought, but, but it's worked out. And it has, like, pro, being in the provinces has its pros and cons, but you know, the, the, we always wanted to see if we could actually really take the business to the, to the world um, from the provinces. You know, can we reinstall some faith in that that provincial growth is real and and you can you can do it, especially with technology. And I think we've certainly led the way, and certainly like released as well, who are down here too. Um, you know, ask your team. You know, we're growing a bit of a tech hub um, in Hawke's Bay here, but it's got everything for technologists. The thing what we're trying to do is empower local um, entrepreneurs to come through the system. We're trying to empower EIT as an institutional training facility to, to start thinking bigger about the technologies that they're and, and go for that higher end that the, the sort of the masters and doctorates so we can pick them up and keep them here as well. So it's a, you've got to build an ecosystem for it to really work effectively. And that's kind of what we're trying to do um, yeah. as, a, as a unit down here. Now, that's really exciting. It must have been a hell of a winery tool that you took the team on uh, once they got down there for that test weekend. Um, to get them all. I don't know. I don't remember it. I only, I only see photos. <laughs> no, it was it was good. I, my, yeah, it was it was uh, it was fantastic. And and they, we've had some great times down here. It's so much fun. Like the weather, you know, you can't beat the weather here. It's just um, you just we're just so lucky. And I think people are now the, and the opportunities to really dive into, especially looking at machine vision uh, and sort of vision intelligence. Like the the you know you can really touch and feel very successful, fast-moving industries like, you know, horticulture, agri-tech, um, port operations, forestry. So it's all here in one region and really successful companies here which are, are innovative that you can partner with. So it's a breeding ground for innovation. There's no doubt about it. So, um, But it, it needs support and it needs the government to, to be sort of thinking a bit, uh, a, a bit more around, you know, the, the, you know, the, the provincial growth fund, you know, it, it, it's I don't know whether I, whether I agree with with how that was distributed or not. I'm, it's a different point, but there definitely needs to be some um, incentives for other businesses to move uh, satellite offices at least down into the provinces and create jobs and inspire kids in the regions. Yeah, simple as yeah, that. I mean, it's a it's a very cool story. I think to also, as you said, to hear um, and see the growth path of release as well, just uh, up the road from you and seeing that yep. you know the global growth that um, both yourself and they're experiencing with some pretty amazing customers abroad that it can be done from the region. So, yep. um, yeah, it's really cool to hear that story. Now, we'd love to switch gears a little bit and sort of get the crystal ball out. Um, you guys have in some ways flown under the radar from my perspective relative to the size and scale of the operations and the customers that you're dealing with. But yep. you know, what, is, what does the business look like five years from now? You've got opportunities in multiple different industries, but where would you love to see Fingermark if we were to sort of fast forward five years from now? So um, the, the Fingermark is, is, has got its, I, 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 I personally believe Fingermark has, has got a massive runway. We, we're only, you know, we're, we're doing 
some great numbers and we, we, we haven't really even had a massive US based rollout where well, we haven't, you know. Um, so the numbers there are, are, are amazing and the opportunities there are amazing with, with that. And we've just got to stay focused on that. I think that what we're finding is spawning off different businesses, and we certainly did with that with Florence, is there will, you know, you, you've got to have that focus. I think your, your, your businesses need to be focused and, and passionate about a vertical. So, you know, we've got this, this new business there, which is based in the, um, the mining sector or industrial application sector, health and safety focused. So that business will, will spawn off and probably it's grow its own head. But Fingermark is, is on a, a massive growth trajectory. There's no doubt about it. And the exciting thing is that we really haven't put the foot to the floor. We've been sort of in that R&D phase, just waiting, looking at the industry. COVID has just fast-tracked everything we were doing and validated and qualified all of the technology decisions we'd made in the last sort of three or four years. Uh, we were building drive through only, like five lane with KFC in Australia. We built one of those, these things pre-COVID, and now the whole industry is moving to that model. You know, we developed machine vision, computer vision technology for drive through and more data out of the drive through. Drive through now is 80% of a, a restaurant's revenue. So all of these things, it's just it's up to us to just grab hold of, of the opportunities and, and, and go faster. Uh, in terms of the mining application, um, I've said this over and over in the last six months, that is an absolute billion dollar business. There's no doubt about it. Um, the, the numbers, the trajectory, the customers we're working with now and the, 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 the Greenfields opportunity there, that is um, that, that I think will take a different path to Fingermark. I think Fingermark can grow based on its own revenue and, and can be quite a nice, you know, call it a family owned business. Um, but uh, and, and without too much capital rejection, but I think Theo is going to become the, the, the big, you know, this will be a VC play. This will be something quite different, possibly a listing. Um, and and for me, I think I, I need that. I need something different from what I've I've taken finger mark on the journey, um, and and to see where, whether whether we can um, nail that one too. So uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's all really exciting, and and you know hopefully we're the the bottom line is we're creating jobs for people and um, and also challenging people that that want to step up and be challenged. That's the most important thing. Yeah, interesting. So with the, the mining um, play, can you, in sort of simple language, explain like, what your technology does for that industry or give an example of how it might potentially be uh, utilised in that industry? So the, the first application we developed with, um, basically, it's, a, it's a, 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 an industry, um, uh, safety industry over in Australia. It's, it's represented by the four biggest mining companies in the world, Rio, BHP, um, Anglo-American and, and uh, Glencore, and they basically sit above the, the industry and, and try to find solutions for, for serious problems with injury or, or, or death. And one of the one of the highest areas of, of injury or death is in the tyre bay where they're changing tyres on these all of this machinery. And they're just 24-7, these guys are just changing tyres. So what we've done is basically augmented machine vision. It's actually really complex how we've tr we've tackled it, but um, we've we've managed to nail it. And we're basically creating dynamic zones around machinery. So think of a human machinery interactions. So there's 636 stages of this process that they have to go to change the four tires. We map every single one of those processes, and then we create a special zone, dynamic zone around the machinery and the human. So um, it basically is way more intensive than the old red lines on the ground, um, and but also it's it's recording snapshot, um, passing that off for later retrospective analysis and training, but also it's it's alerting. So it's um, you know alerting people when when they're breaching safety zones, um, but but it's all really relevant to the stage of the process that it's in. So it's not it's not generic. So we we. We're, you know, creating a much health, a safe, safer zone um, in the area, and then also at the same time we're creating massive operational efficiency. So we're shaving time off this process um, by uh, by applying this technology. So it's a win-win. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I imagine ultimately uh, will save lives uh, once that sort of starts to get implemented as well. I reckon we've saved a couple already. <laughs> awesome! That's pretty cool to hear. 
And then in terms of that growth uh, path for both businesses, you are going to yep. obviously need a lot of people to continue to help build out that vision. Aside from the specific roles, what, you know, when you're hiring, what are some of the key traits and characteristics that you look for people um, that are approaching you? So I think problem solvers, um, uh, you know, you, you've got to come in with a problem solving attitude. Um, uh, I think I think that's that's the key. Like I I, I do, you know, the, the times I do get frustrated when people bring bring your problems and not solutions. Um, I don't I don't mind hearing about a problem, but as long as you've got it, you, you're having a crack at trying to trying to fix it. Um, I think I think the attitude around think big. You've you've got to you've got to back yourself, have confidence. You've you've got to realize that that you, you want this product to be put into the hands of as many people as possible, not just, you know, so you've got to get out of that R and D grungy, um, you know, you know, feel, um, which, which, you know, finger mark has been kind of renowned for. So changing that and bringing people on that, that are ready and have skills that, that can scale technology um, and scale it with, with, uh, with real success. So that's, that they are the sort of people that we're looking for. Machine vision, um, understanding data and a, and a real passion for data as well um, a, a, a is another trait that, that we, we've, you know, the ones that are coming in that appreciate the power of it, um, of data, are, are the ones which generally have the most success in, in, in the company. So, um, and just, I think people with a, well, we're, we're a pretty lighthearted bunch, you know, when we're, you know, there, there are times when there people are under pressure, but most of the time, it's about enjoying your work, um, and and kind of I, I think it's about getting projects done and nailed, hitting timelines, um, and then in between having having a lot of fun. You know, it's it's what it should be. Yeah, it's something that probably uh, sometimes get lost or can get lost quite quite easily, um, depending on where you're working. Absolutely, yeah, I yeah. see that. And then for you, Luke, you kind of, before we let you get back to your day, but um, sort of listening to your journey and listening to, you know, someone that didn't necessarily nail high school and, and wasn't overly interested in going on and um, sort of doing higher education, but found yourself in business and going through that trial and error phase. Was there any period there that you had, you know, people provide career advice or some nuggets of wisdom that helped you along that journey or is there anything that sticks out that could potentially be really relevant for other people that might want to have a crack at being an entrepreneur or even just joining a tech company like yourself? Yep, yeah, there's there's been a there's been a lot, um, and I've been fortunate enough to be plugged into to some of New Zealand's great um, technology leaders and and uh, um, inspiring leaders. Um, I think one of the things. Um, that is, it is so true. And I said this before, it's focus, you know, I remember Sir Peter Mayer saying that to me, uh, he said, no, you've got too much going on. You just need to focus, go, go hard at, at one thing. He also told me to, to cost out. He said, if the, you, you, when you're building hardware, you, your profits in your, in your margin and then build it as cheap as you can. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So, um, which has worked out to be very true as well. Um, I think it's, I, I think uh, probably the, the the key is never stop innovating. Like the minute you 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 settle, become complacent, you think you've finished a product. A product is never finished, ever finished. And those that that um, um, and I know some people that that would have you know may have worked with me in the past. Um, they 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 may have a differing uh, opinion, but you've got to continue the evolution. You should have a full roadmap. You should have ideas. The day that you stop having ideas is the day you may as well step off the bus because um, you'll get superseded. You, you've, you know, New Zealanders are, are, are great at innovation. Um, we're great at taking products to the world. We undersell ourselves. Um, but the one thing we do really well is we look at problems in a different way to others, and you cannot underestimate the power of that. Um, so you've got to back yourself and you've got to keep thinking. But eventually people copy you. So if you don't have that next idea or that next pivot, then you'll get taken over. Um, so I'd say that's it's, it's the best advice I've been given, but it's not really advice. It's just, that's just, it's common sense, right? Yeah. And I suppose, does that uh, permeate right through the culture there in terms of uh, just everyone thinking in the same manner of that continued innovation? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, they're, they're trying to they're trying to clip my wings a bit, but um, uh, that's their job. Um, I, I've I've got ideas coming out my ears, but um, but and, and there is a there, it's an it's, it's an interesting subject at the moment because I'm researching whether you know where R and D sits in our business. You know, does it you know does it spin out and sit in a different different camp? Where your BAU team, your scaling team, and your deployment teams are are, are, are tight, but your R and D is you know, but you've got a really clever way of reintroducing the R and D into the into the into the mix, and that, that's something that we're absolutely at a crossroads right now about innovation and 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 where that li lives and sits. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting. I'll, I'll be able to tell you more about it in six to twelve months once we've investigated it a bit further. Yeah, interesting. And then finally, before we leave you, uh, Luke, in terms of for the people that are listening to this that might be curious about um, reaching out, why is now such a, an exciting time to be joining um, one of your businesses? Well, uh, there's there's no doubt that, that we're we're on a, you know, you get to work with the the biggest companies in in their field, and that's what we're really good at. Um, you get, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a free thinking company and organization um, where ideas are, are, are certainly not um, um, filtered, they're embraced. I think, you know, we're going through a time now where we need to turn all of our ideas and concepts into something that not just 150 people can use at a time, but now it's 10,000 people can use at a time. And I think in, in, some, in, in, in the eyes of some, that is a really exciting challenge. And in the eyes of, of, of quite a few, they would have been there before in, in, that, in that part of the journey. So we're looking for, for, for skilled people in that area that, that, that want to go from there to there, you know. Um, and, you know, that's... And, and you know, you don't have to want to come down to Hawke's Bay, but you, you're certainly going to be spending a bit of time down here. So you've got to enjoy the good Chardonnay and, and mountain biking and a bit of surfing as well. So Outstanding. Well, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. And for everyone that uh, managed to make time uh, today to listen, hopefully you got a lot out of it. It's, you know, from an outside observer's perspective, it is one of those companies that I think um, – is such an incredible organic growth story and it's really cool to hear just you know what's next in terms of the opportunities that you're tackling uh, across the the board so thanks for being so candid luke and we look forward to following along the finger mark journey no worries greg pleasure to be here thanks for your time <laughs>